Hello and welcome to episode 51 of the Physique Development Podcast. Today we're continuing our five or six part series. We're not quite sure yet. Uh, <laughs> we, we think we're going to add a, an episode on the tail end of this and talk about uh, fatigue management, but we'll get into that here in just a minute. So we're going to continue our five part ish series on program design. Today's episode is going to be all going to be all about training progressions. Now we were going to attack on fatigue management, deloads, all of those things. And we thought that it would be a bit too long of an episode and it may get a bit jumbled and muddy the waters of our conversations around training progression. So we wanted to add that to a new episode. So essentially today's all about training progressions and we'll dig into that over the course of episode five here of this program design 101 series. So I wanted to start out essentially going over what we've done so far, right? And when you're listening to these episodes, we're not trying to memorize stuff, right? We're just going to review things. We are going to go over things, try to ma grasp the main concepts of our conversation today and what we're going to talk about. Try not to get too into the weeds or try to memorize every little thing, right? You can always listen back. You can always rewind. You can always ask us questions over social, things like that, right? And we'll talk about those in future episodes if you have them. So don't try to memorize everything. My main point here. All right. So as we're diving into today's episode, we've talked so far about training volume, which is mainly the sets per week per muscle group, right? We've talked about training intensity, which is related to load lifted or the effort we use throughout our sets. We've talked about training frequency and the training split, meaning how often we are training muscle groups and how we organize those training sessions. And then we've talked about exercise selection, the exercises we're choosing to use, are we choosing to use, yeah, in those, in those sessions, right? So today's episode is all about how to progress these components to maximize your results and how we have, or as we have throughout this entire series, we're going to mainly focus on building muscle and improving body composition. Okay. So that's mainly the side that we're going to be coming from here, right? We're not going to be talking about maximizing strength potential and making it to the Olympics as far as strength sport goes, right? We're not talking about that stuff. We're talking about building muscle, improving body composition, and truly developing your physique. So when we talk about training progression, what does that mean essentially? So the main term that you are probably going to hear within the realm of training progression is going to be progressive overload, right? And progressive overload is commonly defined as the proactive addition of stress or stimulus, most commonly in the form of sets, reps, or load that you're adding over time. More accurately, progressive overload should be thought of as something that occurs as a result of hard training, right? It's hard to progressively overload if we're not training hard, progressively, and consistently over time. So for example, an increase in reps that you're able to do at a given weight or the ability to lift heavier loads is the confirmation that overload has occurred. When considering things like recovery and good exercise technique alongside increased reps or load, we know that true progressive overload has once again occurred, right? So we have some checks and balances that we can keep track of along our training phase or months of training to ensure that progressive overload is actually occurring. Now, there are a few ways that we can add progressive overload to our training, right? And that's in the form of, and I'm gonna go into each one of these a little bit more, but that's in the form of adding reps and load, as we mentioned. You can add sets to your workouts. You can add a progressive uh, proximity to failure or effort in the form of reps and reserve or RPE to those sessions, or you can progress your rep tempo. And we'll get into that as well. And exercise technique plays a big role in that as well, which we'll end with here uh, in this first segment. So adding reps and load. So as you get more experience with strength training, your rep quality will increase, right? So that means you will increase the amount of tension placed on the target muscles within each rep. And the more tension we have, 
the more of the given muscle tissue will be active, both from a contractile and metabolic perspective, which is a very, very good thing when we're looking to build muscle and improve body composition, right? So when aiming to progress in your sessions, adding reps or total weight in your hand is a good way to do it. When adding weight or reps to your sets plateaus, right? When you hit a plateau with that uh, method, you may want to start adding sets to the exercise to help increase the total training volume being performed, right? So the next thing is adding sets to our sessions, right? So adding sets is a popular way to progress your training volume or your intensity in a strength-based program if you're in something like that. An increase in training volume has shown to provide an increased ability to lead to more muscle growth, but this is only to a point, right? So we can't just add sets, you know, ad nauseum and essentially get away with it, right? There's, there's a limit to the training volume that we can add without reaching a point of diminishing returns. And the total number of sets, which we did go over in the the training volume episode, which is episode one of this series, if you want to go back and listen to that. So the total number of sets that are recommended can vary per individual based on your skill level, your training age, and many other factors, right? And the current understanding of productive training volume is a, in a range of 10 to 20 sets per week per muscle group. And the more sets per week that you could possibly do and help increase muscle growth, it could also potentially reduce muscle growth if it exceeds a certain maximum recoverable threshold, right? So if you blow past your recoverability, well, that's not gonna be very productive for our ability to put on muscle and improve performance over time, which is important, again, for progressive overload, right? So it's important that as we are thinking about these, these progression models and, and methods of, of progressing these things or our, our workouts, it's important that we are keeping in mind that there are recoverable thresholds, right? There's a reco recoverability threshold that we can all withstand within those efforts, right? Which goes into a lot of other factors. Another thing to note is that the higher the quality of your reps, the more tension will be placed on the target muscles, right? So this in and of itself is an increase in progressive overload on the muscle. So over time, you could theoretically achieve a very similar stimulus with fewer total sets per week on any given muscle group. And I, I imagine as we open up the floor here in today's episode, we're going to discuss that theoretical situation and how we've seen that turn into real progress with clients. Okay, so the last two methods of progressive overload here, one is progressing reps in reserve or RPE within your sessions, right? So increasing your proximity to failure acts as a method of progression within the stimulus by increasing your total work intensity, right? Effort while also resulting in more overall fatigue. So beginner trainees are recommended to stay between two to four reps shy of failure, right? This would fall somewhere between the six to eight RPE range. This aids in the management of fatigue this ensures consistency in your training performance, your ability to recover, and reduces the risk of injury over time, right? So beginner trainees, we're not wanting to go to failure all of the time. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about that today when we open up the floor to past mistakes that we may have made <laughs> in our training sessions. So advanced trainees can be more progressive with the increased proximity to failure or RPE metric throughout their training phases. And a common progression is to reduce your reps in reserve by one point per week, right? This is just a method to use, right? This isn't tried and true or something you have to do. It's just something you could do, right? To progress this component. So for example, in week one, if your reps in reserve was three to four, maybe in week two, you could go two to three reps in reserve and so on and so forth throughout your training phase until you hit a point of peak fatigue, you end up having to deload, which we'll talk about in the next episode with fatigue management. All right, so the last big one we're going to talk about today is progressing your rep tempo, right? And tempo is one of the most important considerations for any trainer or coach when designing a training program. And it's something that isn't talked about quite as much, especially within certain circles and communities as being something that is an important consideration within program design. And if you guys have been sticking around us, looking at our content, you'd know that we find this to be quite an important consideration. And this is sort of where we 
uh, I think diverge from other communities and circles in the way that they sort of think about rep tempo, right? So rep tempo best represents the pace at which you're performing a given exercise. So for example, how much time are we spending at the bottom of a barbell back squat or at the top of a glute bridge, right? So paying attention to your rep tempo can do a few things for your training in terms of progressions. Number one, it can allow you to control and manipulate momentum during an exercise and use it more to your advantage, which again is a very important component of program design and your ability to execute a program, right? And that's going to affect your ability to recover. It's going to affect what we're doing from an, you know, other programming considerations. So again, a very important thing. Two, it can allow you to manipulate how much time you spend in a part of a rep that is most challenging. So again, for example, in a back squat, we can manipulate how fast we are lowering ourselves into the bottom position. We can also pause at the bottom of that rep where the tension is greatest. And all of this is going to have a different training effect or training stress on you, on your muscles, on your physiology as a whole. And it's going to play into how we are programming the rest of your uh, training program. And number three, it can give you or the coach another method of manipulating the training stimulus or stress across an entire training phase or months of training, right? So a very important consideration that you may have not heard much about especially if you're just starting to consume our content, but something that we talk a lot about as an important consideration of program design and a progressive model of overload within that training program design. So the last thing that is uber important and can act as a progressive stimulus to your training is exercise technique, right? This is the, one of the most beneficial things that isn't discussed quite enough, which leads us into our next segment where I open up the floor to Miss Sue and Mr. Alex. So essentially, what role has exercise technique? I'm going to address, I'm going to have Sue go here. I'm going to have Sue go first. What role has exercise technique played in the progress of your clients and how their progress has gone throughout the years, right? So what, what role has exercise technique played in that? Uh, one of the largest roles. I mean, if you can lift a weight and you're not actually contracting the muscle and you are not having proper execution, there isn't much of a point except possibly jamming your joints or saying that you did lift that weight. When it comes to truly being able to progress within training, the biggest hurdle is first execution. And that's why within this podcast series, we've talked a lot about we bring volume down to start off. We really focus on the foundation. And that's not something we just say. That's something we really do. And you can ask our clients. And it's something that we are very iterative of as we go through it because we understand the importance. So actually, after this series, there will be an episode uh, where Coach Caleb and I go over the importance of exercise execution and how you can do some things to best suit you and to um, help you as a client if you do have a coach, as well as help you if you are your own coach. But um, I can talk specifically to one of my clients right now. Her name is Paige. She was dealing with an anterior pelvic tilt. She also didn't know how to properly properly brace her core and her movements were suffering because she was getting sore and especially in her lower back, which some of you might be nodding along of, oh yeah, I, I love being able to do RDLs or deadlifts or a hip thrust, but man, my lower back hurts the next day. And she was just not progressing at the rate that we wanted her to. We really took a step back and we went back to the foundations, really focused on her core, her breathing, her execution, and got that all nailed down. And and she has added so much weight and so much progression to her exercises and been able to truly contract her musculature. And she has even expressed to me, hey, I might have been able to lift this much prior, but I had nowhere near the same tension, nowhere near the same contraction, and definitely nowhere near the same um, ability to recover from these exercises as well. So the ability to truly focus on your exercise technique is going to be one of the first forms of progression you should even focus on because it doesn't matter as far as adding reps or sets to a bad exercise or a bad execution of an exercise. Because like I said, that's just going to cause some more jamming and some discomfort. So being able to really focus on that exercise execution, I would say is the number one thing you can do for progressive overload because that's the base and the core of what allows you to have any progression moving forward. 
Yeah. And I think that one thing that we are, are known for is our glute training. And so within the glute training, we don't have any new exercises that we're going to teach you that are within your, your glute training. It's going to still be the leg press. It's still going to potentially be a back squat, a, a hip thrust, a split squat, those variations, but you can still perform those exercises and not target the tissue properly mm -hmm. and find yourself in a position where you're getting more quad bias or as Sue alluded to speaking to um, the joint jamming and just feeling high fatigue and kind of rushing through the movements and those different factors. And so a big part of the success that we have within our clients is going to be the execution and allowing for them to see progress one in a much more healthy fashion to where they're recovering and um, executing the movements properly and actually placing tension on the musculature rather than the, the joints themselves or uh, utilizing the stretch reflex and those different factors. So a big part of the success of our clients comes down to the exercise execution. Yeah, taking three steps back to take 10 forward, right, is what we kind of always say and or some iteration of that. <laughs> um, but it's very, very important that we're nailing down exercise technique. And I think uh, and I think we'll mention this in our programs, but are the programs that we did ourselves in the past. But as far as a foundational phase to to nail down exercise technique, this is definitely something that you know, we're getting, we're getting videos from clients when they're, they're onboarding, we're getting videos in those first months of their training to ensure that our efforts are not only there from a, okay, is our effort there from a standpoint of, are you pushing, but is our ability to even set up for that exercise sufficient? Is our ability to, to keep our exercise technique as fatigue builds? Is that, is, that's a very important factor of building muscle and improving body composition over time, right? Especially as we're using strength training as our tool there. So exercise technique is very, very important. And I really wanted to, to highlight that in this episode. So I'm glad we, I'm glad we could touch on that. So our next thing here that I'm going to address to, to Alex, in terms of exercise progressions, how do we start to decide what that'll look like across a given training phase? Are you making decisions from the beginning, is it is it more adaptive as you go, seeing how the client reacts? What's that look like? It's going to vary from individual to individual. The one place that we start with all of our clients is that we have them send with their onboarding a, a hip hinge option within their training. So maybe they're performing a conventional or sumo deadlift or uh, an RDL variation, and then we'll have them send a squat variation. And so when they send these things over, we're going to be able to see their mechanics within uh, those movements specifically, and we'll be progressing the training depending on what their execution looks like there. So it's a good starting place for us to understand really where the athletes coming from. Whereas if we just took their onboarding and they didn't send any training clips, we may be prescribing an exercise that is not aligned with their uh, training level or their ability to execute, putting them at a higher propensity of injury, as well as just lackluster progress. And so within the actual training phases, as they continue, those movements are going to progress more from a, a base movement. So if we're looking at um, an individual who can barbell back squat, then we may be starting there and then adding in some unilateral work as the movements progress on. And same goes within the, the RDL where we may have more variety, but really we want to stick with our, um, kind of our big rocks, if you will, within movement selection as a whole and allow for them to progress within the load that they're selecting rather than getting too crafty within the exercise selection. And I think that's a big part uh, for the listeners to understand is that it's not a matter of, of getting super fancy within the movements and, and doing all of these kind of off the wall things. It's going to be a matter of getting really good at the basics and understanding a muscular tension and your active range of motion and those different factors for you to progress very heavily through those exercises. Yeah. And the other thing there is just the, um, the videos like Alex mentioned are so helpful, but also knowing that if you find something out along the way and you're a coach or again, you're coaching yourself and listening to this, do not be afraid to change the game plan because there is something that you figured out as you went. Um, so for example, I had clients in video, but then it wasn't until a little bit later on, I found out the client had a split abdomen and there were some things we had to do to fix that. So we removed all 
all ab training. And I did it after I'd sent over all of her training and she had gone through like one or two days. And I was like, hey, we're making a change. We're removing all ab tra training. We're changing these exercises because we can't brace or stabilize them. And don't be afraid to change the plan if you find out more information. In fact, that is going to be a mark of a great coach is not being afraid to tr change the plan um, instead of feeling like, oh, I have to kind of swallow this because I already sent it over and things changed. No, you can always explain, hey, we learned new information. We're changing that from there. And I, I like the comment that Austin made as far as taking those few steps for back to take those multiple steps forward. But honestly, especially when it comes to exercise execution, you're not necessarily taking steps back because you didn't have those steps actually taken. You had kind of faked those other steps of being able to grab that heavier weight. And I often hear clients be like, well, I was able to lift heavier before, but are, were you actually contracting the muscle? If you weren't, then it doesn't really matter what weight that you were lifting before. And so instead of looking at it as I'm taking all these steps back and I have to really slow down my training, just really remind yourself, I am like, finalizing the foundation. I am firming up that foundation so I can continue to build on this and to become whatever I want to be from that because the foundation is so sturdy. And one thing I will add with the progressions uh, within tempo. And so as we talk about tempo, I'm just going to quick, quickly touch on this is that there's four digits. The first digit is going to be the eccentric portion of the movement. The second digit is going to be the time spent in the lengthened position of the exercise. The third number is going to be the concentric portion. And then the fourth number is going to be time spent in the shortened range. Now we can get into lengthened and shortened work in the 201 series that we do for all this. I don't mean to confuse anyone, but when we are talking about the tempo allocations, when I start with a client, I'm generally going to utilize a tempo that is going to um, push forward eccentric loading. So maybe a three zero one zero tempo to get them acclimated to just having better control through the movement. I'm not using it in the sense of like, let's target the more lengthened or shortened position of the exercise. I'm just wanting better control through the exercise as a whole. And so from there, once we gather videos within their execution from a week to week perspective within their check-ins, if I'm seeing them kind of flying through an exercise, maybe they're performing an RDL and where that second number and the four number prescription is going to be um, a, a zero in that context, but maybe they're bouncing out of it. I'll add a one there to uh, force them to be in a position where they have to pause. And that's going to allow for them to create better tension within the most important piece of that specific exercise, as well as it keep them in less of a position of injury, as well as learning more about their active range of motion and putting them in a, a better position to make gains and, and progress within their strength, as well as their hypertrophy and, and those different factors. So when we're utilizing tempo, a lot of it is just teaching control in the exercise. And as we get more advanced, we will be able to utilize that to emphasize different lengths of the tissue and uh, get fancy with it, if you will. But at the core, we're really wanting to see better control of the exercise itself. Yeah, great point. And just with him saying the first number is the eccentric, not every exercise starts with the first number. And I know that PD clients are very aware of that, but if you're going through this, learning about tempo, the first number is always the eccentric, but not all exercises start with an eccentric. So just something to keep in mind. Super nerdy stuff. <laughs> Super nerdy stuff, right? Um, so putting like the 3010 tempo into consideration, right? It Typically, like in my experience with clients, it... As you, as you mentioned, Al, it's really highlighting the eccentric portion of that movement, right? Because typically it's not the other, again, I say typically, it's not the other components are portions of those reps that are out of control. It's most often people's eccentric portion of a movement that is out of control. And we're thinking of things like an RDL or a back squat or maybe a bench press or something like that where not only is that eccentric portion of that rep probably the most productive towards muscle growth and a muscle stimulus as a whole, but it's very, very important that we control that for the sake of injury prevention, for the sake of uh, learning good movement patterns to progress into the future, right? And changing different components of that rep tempo can certainly help, right? So again, in Alex's uh, example was, 
adding a, a one or a pause to the end, you know, into an RDL, right? So not only does that help you almost force you to control your eccentric, but it forces you to also become more aware of the deceleration component at the bottom of an RDL. Because if you're not decelerating 300 pounds on a bar, well, good luck trying to pause <laughs> at the bottom of that. You know, like yeah. it's going to, it's going to be like a cartoon. The weight's somehow going to go straight through the floor. Your feet are going to fly up to the ceiling and it's not going to be good, right? Um, so learn how to decelerate your reps, learn how to control your eccentrics, right? And we don't use rep tempo to overcomplicate things. We use rep tempo to simplify things leading into the future, right? So the more you understand control of tension, control of movements and your ability to, to execute, execute those movements over time, the easier and to me, the more enjoyable the training experience becomes and the more effective and efficient your efforts are with time spent in the gym, right? And, and the more you can actually lend towards, you know, those, that resource allocation of volume or intensity or, or anything towards the things you actually want to, to progress and perform. Right, you're not spending as much time doing all the the other stuff quite as much because you're more focused and intentional with that work. Very important points there. All right, so Sue, what? We'll start with you here. Talking about training progressions, talking about exercise technique, talking about all these things. What progressions are you making most within client programs? Is it mainly technique based at first, and then progresses into maybe adding sets? What does that typically look like for you uh, per client? if you can go into that. Yeah. So it is something that majority of my clients, the main thing we're focusing when it comes to progression is exercise execution. So that's why I am so adamant about it because it is what I do a lot in my daily life and my daily check-ins is really being able to hammer down how they are executing. Because I can say the clients that send the least amount of videos normally, not always, but normally will make the least amount of progress because it's something that I don't have this metric to help them. I just have to assume that they know what they're doing. And I don't like to assume because you make an ass out of you and me. So being able to see those videos is so extremely important. And if you are someone who thinks, oh, I don't need someone to see my videos, I got this down pat, you might even more so need someone to see your videos, um, just because you might need an objective eye. And there's always things that you can fine tune. Even Alex, even Austin, even myself, as advanced trainees, we still take video, we still still have other people look at it. And there's always room to progress, especially as you progress in load, you are going to have to be able to check your form again, because it's going to change as the load gets heavier of how you're able to execute that movement. So majority of my clients main progression is really looking at the um, exercise execution and then kind of taking a, a dive into volume because, again, a majority of my clients were really nailing down their recovery. We're nailing down their routine, their sleep, their stress metrics. So once we get that nailed down, I can really increase the volume within SEPs or RETs sets or reps or load. But it is great because I have a few clients on my roster that I've been on there for a much longer time frame. And so we're really able to do some fun stuff with some of these other metrics. And I even have a few of the PD coaches on my roster. And that's really fun because they are super nerdy like us too, and really want to learn it. And we're able to just play around with some fun stuff and to be able to see these minute changes as we go through it. Yes, I agree. Uh, whether I'm working with a lifestyle client, a high level um, national competitor, an IFBB pro, all of them start with exercise execution. And I know that it may sound crazy that with the, the IFBB pros that I've worked with, that I work with currently, that I'm starting with exercise execution. And it can be a little bit of a uh, punch in the ego for those clients because it's like, what do you mean, dude? I don't need to fix my hip thrust. I don't need to fix my RDL. Look at my glutes. I look great on stage. There, there's no way that I'm not getting adequate tension to these glutes. And, and the reality is, is that they may just be more ge genetically blessed or something along those lines. And we still have to dig into the execution and fine tune things there. So every client is going to start out in a place of figuring out better structure to their, their training as a whole, obviously, but also going to be the exercise exercise execution that they're completing. And so within 
that from there, what we're going to do is progress within intensity and load and those different factors prior to us adding total sets. Because once we get the execution in the better place, oh my gosh, the load is going to, to skyrocket from there. So it may be tough for a couple of weeks as we get things figured out and we figure out why we're not having adequate execution of things. But once that's figured out, now we can move a greater quantity of load at a much faster pace because we're executing so much better. And and so it's a lot of load and intensity markers before we really add a whole lot of working sets because now the tissue is working adequately and being targeted for a greater duration of time under greater loads. Thus, the workload that we need is going to lessen and we'll be able to elevate that as time goes. But uh, that's how I go about things. Yeah, every, every world-class athlete and whoever trickles down from them does the fundamentals day in and day out right? They have coaches for the fundamentals. Some have coaches for each fundamental itself, right? And so these world-class athletes, you know, Steph Curry has a shooting coach. Steph Curry's got a dribbling coach. LeBron's got a shooting, like all these players, all these people, all these world-class athletes, the best sprinters in the world have a coach for a fundamental, right? They work on their sprint technique. So why is you as a, you know, as someone who likes to train like a bodybuilder or is a bodybuilder or wants a, to improve their physique why are you not working on the fundamentals man that's what kills me right mm -hmm. that kills me and in the season of march madness it's something that as a kentucky fan first i'll just take the dagger to the heart well r.i.p to fan <laughs> r.i.p <laughs> to so many teams but <laughs> yeah. what this goes in line i promise i'm not just you know going off board talking about kentucky but it is something that they forgot how to do the basics they got so their heads either got blown up with how good they were at one point in the year or something happened and they forgot to focus on the basics and it showed like they deserved to lose that game because they didn't pass the ball. They didn't like pass the ball correctly. They couldn't shoot correctly. They couldn't dribble correctly. They couldn't do any of the basics correctly. And they could have been an elite team, but they didn't focus on that foundational aspect. And so just like Austin is saying of like these elite athletes have coaches for these very basic or what we view as basic skills because they do them all the time. The reason they're so good at it is they continue to focus on the basics. The basics are always going to be what you need. The foundations are always going to be what you need. They're never going to lessen in importance and they're always going to help you move that needle forward. Everybody wants to train like a classic bodybuilder until that means doing the same boring exercises year after year after year. Right. Because if you look at the you, you look at these golden era bodybuilders that we all idolize, right? Throughout our lives at some point. Your Arnold's, whatever, right? Arnold did the same boring exercises year in, year out. Each hour in the gym, he spent six hours a day, whatever the hell the, the mythology is around it. <laughs> the dude did the same basic fundamental exercises year after year after year and progressed them year after year, right? Which progressed his physique in different ways. And that's an attest to getting really, really good at creating tension, really good at allocating tension and volume to certain muscle groups or areas of the body and staying in the game. Staying in the game is one of the biggest things, right? Not only from a health benefit standpoint of getting the, the, positive outcomes, health outcomes that we get from training just as a human, right? We, there's a lot of benefits to strength training that we get from a health perspective. But not only that, as an athlete, you got to stay in the game because if you're not training, you're not competing, right? So I don't know anyone who can step on stage without training, you know? <laughs> so are not being at the peak or top of their game as far as their training goes. Right. So if you're having to work through consistent injuries, if you're having to work through lackluster training, it's just not going to add up quite as effectively for you comparatively to your ability to properly execute movements and properly progress your training over time. Right. And one of the last, I, I want to touch on this briefly here before we move on is the <clears throat> paralysis by analysis. Right. So something that we've all struggled with at some point 
as lifters and trainees ourselves, but we've helped clients work through this, this stage of paying closer attention to their exercise technique. You get paralysis by analysis. You yeah. get this perfectionist mindset of, oh, that was, that wasn't, you know, I'm, that was 90%. It wasn't a hundred percent set doesn't count, or that was a, that was a crap set, or I'm discouraged, or it's not worth it. I, I, you know, I'm not there yet. And it's, that's not the approach we want you to take here, right? And you can also hinder your training progress if you spend too much time being super anal and a perfectionist about your exercise technique. So Alex, I mean, what have you seen with your athletes? What's a productive measure of this? So within the paralysis by analysis, I see it on both ends where the individual could be so obsessed with perfecting the exercise that we're getting to like a, an intensity marker of what would be considered like an RPE six. And it's, so we're not seeing, you know, true progressions in place. And so they're finding themselves in a scenario where they feel as though that they're doing everything spot on correctly. And then they're kind of beating themselves up. So it's a lot of internal battle more than anything. And I see this also with tempo, where if we're utilizing the tempo allocations, the individual gets too caught up in the, like being precisely three seconds through the e -center trick one second perfectly in the lengthened position, for example, and so on and so forth. And so the reality, and, and one thing that we really drive home with all of our clients is that I want you to have a, an idea of what three seconds feels like, right? So if you go through a warm up set and you count three seconds down, okay, I have an idea of how long this is because I don't want you in a set where you're going for a, a heavy set of maybe five repetitions in your RDL to be going down for that first repetition going one Mississippi to Mississippi. I, I don't want that. That's going to take away from your overall intensity and it's just going to um, you know, slow our progress probably. And so there are athletes where I have to remove the tempo and we're just I just want you to train. I just want you to be fluent within your motion and kind of navigate through those things. Um, from a, a training perspective, I just want you to be able to execute the movements, take the video, don't worry about you know what's you know, perfect. Just get in there, train hard, um, challenge yourself and those different factors. And so that is something on the flip side of all these great things that we work on. And this is a small percentage of the clients that we, that we work with that run into this. And then we have to navigate and kind of pull them out of it um, and work alongside. So important things, continuing to submit training clips with your coach so that you guys can talk through those things. And then also being vocal with your coach of some of the hurdles that you're experiencing with utilizing some of the parameters. And there are individuals at the early stage of using the tempo that may say, I don't know, this is becoming a little bit more uh, cumbersome than what I would like for it to be. And in those initial stages where you're introducing something new, yes, it's going to be foreign. It's going to be a little awkward, but as you implement those things and, and get comfortable with them, then it becomes a little bit easier. So if it's like the first couple of weeks, it's like, okay, you know, give us a little bit of a breather here. We'll figure this out. But if it continues on past those initial few weeks, then at that point, we may need to remove and, and do something different in those different factors. Yeah. I think too, of, of being, you know, a young athlete growing up, you know, if you, you know, if you grew up playing any sport of any kind, right. Or, or having coaches of some kind, when you first started that sport, you know, let's say you're playing a, a scrimmage game against your other teammates, right? And the coach stops the game pretty frequently because he's like, hey, all right, that was a that was a mistake. We're du you double dribbled, you traveled, we'll stick with basketball. You double dribbled, you traveled, that wasn't a good pass. Well, let's let's make this decision next time. All right, continue playing. Right. And the older you get, the better you get with these fundamentals, the less and less that coach is going to stop the gameplay to review the fundamentals, right? the more continuous you're able to play at full capacity, super hard. And maybe at the end, they have a recap of like, hey, that was a great, great game. A few things here that I wanted to mention, right? As you train, that's the same prog, it's the same timeline when you're training, right? And that's the same thing we're doing with, with clients, with athletes, whatever, is in the beginning, you're having to be pulled out of that gameplay or of that training session a little bit more frequently to say, hey, this was great, this was great, this was great, this is one thing we can work on. All right, get back in there, right? And then the more we progress, the more you you work through those progressions over time, the more at-bats we get, the more reps we get, 
the less we have to stop gameplay, the less we have to stop the training sessions, right? The less we have to nitpick about little things, right? And obviously all of this is very contextual to the individual. We're not nitpicking your, you know, your average gym goer who just is in there to get in better shape, right? We're, we choose our battles. We're choosing when to dive deeper into the weeds. And it depends on that advancement level of the client, of the athlete, what their goals are, all of those things, right? And this is just, that's a very important point to, to any sort of progression advice that we can give or anything across this entire series. It matters per the individual. What are their goals? How invested into this are they? Do they love it? Do they hate it? Because that'll depend on how you give them feedback. All of these things matter, right? And so these are things we're keeping track of with clients, with athletes over time. And one thing I'll add to that is that I've talked about this in other episodes, I believe, but it's much easier to suck at something when you're five relative to when you're 30. And so everyone is experiencing the same level of friction at the age of 30 if the, or, you know, in 20 to 30, however old you are, um, if you're not five, is that it's going to be, you know, challenging to learn new things and to, to not be great at something. And so with that analogy, always understand that other individuals who are in the same shoes as you are struggling with the same stuff. So um, be willing to, to suck for a little bit, trudge through the mud a little bit so you can get better you know, moving forward. Let's look at some programs that we may have done in the past, right? So let's start with you. What mistakes, what, what, what mistakes did we make early on within progressive overload or, or training progression? Yeah, I would say the two biggest mistakes, which kind of go hand in hand, and that's why I'm going with two, is not keeping a training journal as well as not fully understanding what counted as progressive overload. So when it comes to a training journal, we are going to have a full YouTube video on this. So that is coming soon. And I go really in depth on my thoughts on a training journal. But what gets measured gets managed. And there is no way for you to track progress if you're not tracking your progress. So if you are stuck and saying, oh, I'm plateauing, I can't make progress, I just need something different, all of that, and you don't keep a training journal, there's no merit to what you're saying because there's no tracking going on of what your progress is and what that plateau is. So keeping a training journal is going to be monumental in being able to see progress and to have progressive overload because you are tracking those metrics. So if you want to know how we lay out a training journal and what we would recommend, then keep your eyes peeled on our YouTube channel for me to go more in depth on that. And the other one of not understanding what counted as progressive overload, this was a massive mistake when I first started because I was just thinking progressive overload, I need to overload weight. So I thought the only way to progress was to add more weight. I didn't understand it also counted as adding more sets, adding more reps, being at that, like, let's say I can do, um, three sets of 10 with um, 10 pounds for the dumbbell lateral raises. And then I am, if I go to four sets of 12, then I can't do those 10 pounds. That doesn't mean I got weaker. I have to understand that that's more volume in play. And then also taking into account like where tempo is and where those other metrics are. But being able to recognize that if you can do the same weight for more reps, the same weight for less rest, the same weight um, at a different point in your training session, so whether it's at the beginning of your training session or after you've already done multiple movements, those are all going to be forms of progressive overload. But again, you can't know what those are if you also don't keep a training journal. So those would be the two ones that I personally made, as well as not vocalizing well enough to clients when they first got started, was just kind of thinking that we're all in the same headspace, ready, set, go, and then getting months into working with clients and being like, oh, no, you don't keep a training journal. Let me talk through this a little bit more. Yeah. The, the two that I'll bring to the table is weight. I love just, you know, that was the only metric I cared about was increasing weight. It didn't matter if it was for five reps or if it was for three reps. The fact that I was adding weight was the only thing that was important to me. Um, and I was just like, if I got, if I did a set of five and then I went and did a set of three, but I added 20 pounds. Okay, great. I'm going to try to do this set that I just did for three for five next week, which in in hindsight was actually probably a little beneficial. It was, it was, um, 
outlandish to think that I could do that every single week, but I was such a, a newbie within the space and, and eating so many calories that it aided me to be able to push forward more. So in hindsight, it actually worked out okay, but for the majority of individuals, not going to be the, the best idea. And it was short lived too. Like there was a, a point where I got out of the uh, newbie gains of all of the, the things and I looked less like a, um, a pole of an individual, <laughs> uh, weighed more than 150 pounds, those different factors, very important. Um, the second thing was not understanding rest periods. So with rest periods, I would you know go in very highly caffeinated at the time uh, when I first started training was very much so into highly caffeinated pre-workouts. So when I would go in with my first exercise, I would be scratching my face off with the copious amounts of beta alanine as well as having a high amount of caffeine. Thus, my rest periods were as short as possible, um, you know, 15, 30 seconds, I'm ready to go. I wanted to sweat. I wanted to get after it. And I'm like, man, why is the weight going down after each set? And then maybe my friend, Austin potentially, <laughs> uh, was at the gym and we'd sit there and talk between sets or I'd be checking my phone or something along those lines. And then all of a sudden I'm like, damn, I can go up. This is great. This is awesome. I love this. And so not understanding those components was a little bit of a detriment to my overall progress at that time, because there was times where I was waiting you know, 30 seconds between a set. And then there was times where I was waiting seven to 10 minutes because I you know, saw a friend or something along those lines <laughs> and got to chat a little bit. So, um, understanding that your rest period does matter, um, and those different factors is an important piece that we didn't touch on a, a ton today, but is something that can progress um, if we get into the weeds a little bit with the type of training that we're performing, which could be a 201 or like a 301 of, mm -hmm. of this series as a whole. Yeah, I had to make some executive decisions on <laughs> how much time we had today because yeah. I know how deep into the weeds we can go and rest periods in and of themselves could be an entire episode. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Each one of these components can be an entire episode, right? And yeah. Early on in my own training, you know, I think when I was first getting into, when I first found the gym as, you know, we were still doing mainly strength conditioning workouts at this time, Alex. And, but I had found the gym. I think I was a, a freshman in high school at this time. And I had found the gym on, in the evenings and on the weekends. And I'd go and I made it two sets of squats, play a pickup basketball game, do some, <laughs> do a set of curls, go play a pickup basketball game, come back, do a leg press. Oh, you guys need a fifth? Go play a basketball game. And that was the way I lifted, right? Yep. And then that progressed into, okay, I, I kind of got talked into to more physique-based training. I got talked into competing. Then it was like, okay, now we have to do bodybuilding. I was like, all right, cool. Um, so I'll come in and I'll do a few things similar to what Alex, you know, was doing. And then within that first year, you know, one thing I was doing right, which I will, you know, pat myself on the back for at least following instructions. I didn't have these ideas. I just followed instructions was keeping a training lock. I printed out. So I, you know, the first coach I ever had, I've printed out all of his workouts. I had a clipboard that I kept at the gym that I always <laughs> went to and I would grab the clipboard that was stored in the filing system, I'm sure beyond the rules of regulations of that facility. And I would grab that and I would have my last eight weeks of workouts and I'd have every weight that I did and I would always progress it, right? And I got super lucky that I had that guidance and instruction in the beginning, right? And that's one thing I did really well, but I'll also admit I wasn't quite sure about rest periods. Um, I wasn't sure that 10 reps with 60 pounds, but I hit failure the last week, but this week I did 60 pounds for 10 reps. And I think I could have did 12 or 13. I didn't realize that was progression. So then I would do a whole nother set and be like, oh, okay, well now I got to hit failure on this one. What the <laughs> hell? So then I'm just like, you know, and, and again, all this is like, we, we talk a lot about ignorance is bliss, right? At the beginning of our training careers, because to me, there's a component of that that's important, right? And I think if I would have been, the more you understand, the more you re you start to know, it can add a lot of freedom and enjoyment to your training, right? But there also can be a paralysis by analysis sort of thing happen where you start to overanalyze every little 
single second of your training session. And that's exhausting, right? That's not what we're asking you to do. What we're asking you to do is give a shit about the fundamentals, care about them, get good at them, because the better you are at the fundamentals, the better you're going to be at playing the game, right? The more enjoyable the game becomes because you're less worried about the shit that you should have been good at to begin with before you even started to play pickup, right? Or you started to lift with others, whatever, right? Use whatever analogy you want to use here. But it's important to be good at the fundamentals. And that's why today we talked a lot about exercise, exercise technique as a form of progression and a form of progress, progressive overload. Because I think all, with, within all three of us, really, a lot of the, I think a lot of the progressions we saw early on weren't necessarily from this copious amount of muscle tissue we were adding. It was nervous system related, movement pattern related. It was small changes in muscle size probably, but had a lot to do with our ability to generate more tension per rep, right? Which is mostly nervous system based, right? Especially early on within the first three, six months of your training career or, uh, you know, time training. Right. So exercise, te exercise technique is huge. What do you got, Sue? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I have made an incredible amount of progress over the past um, five or six years, however long it's been since I started competing. And people ask me often, all right, what have you done differently? And it's not that I've done so much drastically differently. It's that I've gotten so freaking good at the fundamentals that it's allowed me to have that progression. I've gotten really good at exercise execution. I've gotten really good at understanding my body, really good at nailing down these different metrics here. So it truly is all about the fundamentals. But I did also want to put another add on here with with us talking about that paralysis by analysis as well as that ignorance is bliss. And it is something that if you're listening to this and you're getting so, 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 so overwhelmed, just think brick by brick. And I'm going to do a little small side story. I just started reading Will Smith's new book. And at the beginning of it, he's talking about um, how his dad had him and his siblings build this wall. And it took them a full year to build this wall this brick wall in front of the business. And it was something that he said, like, first, child protective services would be called nowadays. But second, it was something that a few grown men knowing what they were doing, this would take a few days. But this took us a whole year after school, on holidays, so on and so forth. And he was standing outside with his brother and they were like, man, how is this ever going to get done? This is never going to happen. This is impossible. And his dad comes storming out and he was like, all you need to do is lay this one brick down perfectly. Can you do that? And he was like, yeah, I can do one brick down. He was like, okay, stop looking at the whole wall, lay one brick down, then lay another brick down. And Will Smith relates that to his whole entire life of all of the obstacles he's faced. You can look at it and see how accomplished he is, which he's freaking really accomplished. And that can look so overwhelming. And he relates it back to um, his dad told him after that, um, after he said, just lay that brick by brick, he said, don't you ever let me catch you saying that anything is impossible again. And that's kind of how he's built out his life is taking that brick by brick mentality. And you hear us say, say things like stacking pennies, which is another thing of um, within lifting, it's not, oh, I always have to put on the big 45s, put on that two and a half. You're stacking those pennies up and those will relate to something bigger. So just think about taking that one step, stacking that brick, stacking those pennies, instead of getting so overwhelmed by the full picture, just take one step forward of something that you know you can do and keep applying that. Brick by brick, no soft reps. We're on to something. All of it. All we got of all it. the sayings. <laughs> all the sayings. Depositing the, depositing the pennies. Um, all of these are, you know, shout out to Jeff Alberts on that one. That's... um. That's a good way to end this because that's the probably the biggest thing about training progression that we could say from an overview standpoint is it's brick by brick, it's penny by penny, it's no soft rep by no soft rep, <laughs> it's all of the things, right? And those progressions, regardless of how small or how insignificant you think they are, will make the biggest difference months and years down the line within your training, right? 
All right, let's recap today's episode. We'll get you guys out of here. Progressive overload is the proactive addition of stress or stimuli over time. It's brick by brick over time. More accurately, progressive overload should be thought of as something that occurs as a result of doing no soft rep training, <laughs> challenging, hard training. So for example, an increase in reps you're able to do at a given weight or ability to lift heavier loads is the confirmation that overload has occurred. But these other factors are also a way to progress overload and can be or represent overload occurring. Things like adding reps, things like adding load, things like adding sets, things like adding more RPE, more effort, right? Getting closer and closer to failure with similar loads or more load. That's a form of progression. Your ability to manipulate rep tempo, your ability to maintain more tension throughout the eccentric, more control throughout the eccentric with the same load or greater load, right? That in and of itself is progression. Your ability to take the same load over an entire training phase, but you're going from week one to week six in that training phase, let's say, you were able to add a one to two second pause at the bottom of a squat when at the beginning you could you could barely even get that for eight reps now we're adding pauses that's a progression that's crazy right and if you've gone through that progression you realize how crazy that is right and you understand how that small manipulation and rep tempo compounds in strength over time and lastly improving exercise technique is a form of progression a very important one and one that we mainly talked about today, right? <laughs> and it is that brick by brick mentality. It's depositing those pennies and it's getting better and better with each and every rep, right? Because each and every rep, our body is learning things, right? So every rep, every brick we lay, every penny we deposit is extremely important. Do we want to talk about the band Sue? Are we tired of doing that? <laughs> we'll throw it out. So if you want a PD band tee, because we got more stuff possibly coming, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, um, then help us get uh, some things out of our basement. So um, since you are a PD pod listener, you can use code PD pod on the physique development website and grab a band tee for 10% off. If you're getting both band tees, the bundle, the discount is already applied. So go ahead and grab those and we'll catch you in the next one where we talk about fatigue as well as wrap up any of your questions that you have. So definitely submit some questions either to the Google form below or to the question boxes that we'll have on our story. And we'll catch you in that one. Hey, leave us a review if you haven't. That too. Oh, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. One, they're very appreciated. In all seriousness, we appreciate everyone that's left a review. It means a ton. If you haven't and you are a, a listener of this podcast regularly, consistently, you think it's great, leave us a review. It goes yeah. a long way. We appreciate and it. And since we're talking about exercise execution, we didn't even mention to check out our YouTube channel. So if you don't Man. follow us on YouTube, we put out so many videos on exercise execution to make sure that you know how to get the most bang for your buck. So check those out as well.